Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, distributed free software development panel. I hope I'm not mangling that. I was thinking how uh, everybody has thought about the main development model in recent years as the agile model, where a small team of people working very closely together to reinforce each other's bad impulses make the software. So with open source software, we tend to do things differently, and I will now turn everything over to the panel. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, my name is Ed Platt. Uh, I will be uh, acting as the moderator for this panel. A uh, little bit about myself. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan School of Information, uh, formerly uh, founder of the i3 Detroit hackerspace and the Seltzer CRM uh, hackerspace management tool, uh, formerly staff researcher at the MIT Center for Civic Media. Um, and next to me, we have Valerie Young, uh, who currently works at Boku uh, and is also a member of the TC39 JavaScript uh, Standards Committee. Uh, also formerly worked on the Debian Reproducible Builds and with Secretary of Software in the Public Interest. Uh, currently on the steering committee of the Boston DSA, uh, which is a 1600 member activist organization. Uh, so she'll be talking about that. Uh, we also have Amy Zong, the uh, PhD candidate here at MIT at CSAIL in computer, uh, human computer interaction and social computing. Uh, she has many fellowships, uh, at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, the Google PhD Fellowship, and the Gates Fellowship. And her research has won awards at ACM CHI and CSCW. And on the end here, last but not least, we have Christopher Lemmer Weber, uh, who is co-editor of the Activity, Activity Pub Federated Social Networking Protocol Standard, uh, also co-founder of Media Goblin, and former software engineer at Creative Commons, currently working on a project called Sprightly, which I will let him explain uh, in a minute. Um, so that is us. We are your panelists today. We'd be happy to take questions throughout the uh, talk. And uh, what we're going to do is I'll do a brief intro about what we work on before we get into this discussion. So now I will hand it off to Valerie. Hello. Um, so primarily I'll be talking about, of course, this is a panel about large-scale cooperation. So I'll be talking about the free software and software use of a 1,700-person organization in Boston. Um, that's an all-volunteer organization. I'll get, I guess I'll get to that in just a moment. But I uh, wanted to start off to say that it was uh, in college, by f I was radicalized really by free software. And the, the ideas behind free software, the ideas of course of freedom that we all are here for, and also the impressiveness with which uh, people when they're allowed to freely associate and um, collaborate and freely share information and freely share uh, resources and infrastructure, they're able to do incredibly complex difficult tasks coordinated completely um, organically, which is very much uh, an idea in contrast to everything I think we're taught growing up in the structured capitalist society that we are raised in. We're told that things are only done if there's someone in charge, if there's someone who um, owns the operation and has the vision for the operation in, in just one person's head and everyone else is sort of um, you know, beholden to them and must do what they say. So the fact that it seems like thousands of people could contribute to these software projects, um, and uh, of De the Debian project, of course, was like one of the original inspirations or the, the, the original like peering behind the curtain. It's uh, incredible that uh, the Debian project exists and the story of its governance structure and the collaborative model that it has is, of course, a very interesting one. But. Um, Anyway, so the, the, the thing about the free software that really radicalized me was this feeling like, if people can do this for free software projects, can they do this in every other part of their life? Uh, and that leads me to the, the organization that I'm about to talk to, which is the Democratic Socialists of America. So this is a member um, organization that's national. There's 60,000 people nationally in the Democratic Socialists of America. But it's a very distributed organization based on regions or cities. So the Boston Democratic Socialists of America is the chapter that I've been involved in for the last two and a half years. 
Um, the uh, Boston, so, so perhaps, of course, this is, a, a, this is a panel about collaboration, so what is it that this activist organization collaborates on? Um, the, the goal of the Democratic Socialists of America is to try to help transform society from what we have now to one that's fully democratic at every level of our life. So, um, of course, we think about the government as an important place that should have democracy, but as the government that we have currently at, at every stage is not that democratic, you don't really feel like you do get a say. It's, it's controlled largely by moneyed institutions, so this is something that we would like to see completely reformed. Um, but also every other part of our life, so our workplace. We, instead of having uh, a, a workplace where there's a boss and an owner, we would prefer to see fully cooperative, um, collaborative workplaces. So every workplace is instead of, uh, you know, like uh, McDonald's, it's like, uh, um, I don't know, uh, like the Debian Project or Wikipedia. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> Debian Burger? Yeah, Debian Burger. <laughs> That's a dream. Um, so there's, how do we achieve such a project? Um, well, it's every part of society that we're interested in addressing, so the, this is an activist organization that uh, focuses its energy in lots of different ways. So let me describe the structure of the Boston DSA. Um, so the Boston DSA is all itself somewhat of a distributed organization. There are working groups that are somewhat independent of each other that focus on different um, parts of our lives or it, it, uh, ac activist purposes. For example, there's a housing working group that works on uh, housing justice and helps form tenant unions. There's a electoral working group which um, focuses on local elections to get socialists elected to try to transform our local s city governments. Um, we got some social selected to the Cambridge and Somerville uh, governments, uh, you know, city councils um, and aldermen boards, for example. So there are about six working groups in the Boston DSA that all have their own campaigns going on. And then there are uh, committees that focus on the infrastructure of the organization. So connecting members to each other, um, making sure that we have documentation and communication and getting resources to the working groups that need them, and uh, setting up infrastructure to, s to make democratic decisions within the organization for how we use our resources. So one of these committees is the Tech and Infrastructure Committee, which is the committee that I'm on, um, the one that tries to manage all of our digital resources and um, software. Um, okay, so. The, uh, so, so hopefully that gives you a kind of like a picture of what's going on um, with the DSA or what the DSA is. Um, and now I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our software history. So the, the, the whole DSA is an organization that's been around for decades, but two and a half years ago, the Boston chapter in particular, and this is representative of the rest of the chapters in the United States, grew from 100 people to 1,600 people. So there was a, a, two and a half years ago, you might remember what was happening in the United States then, but there was a, a sudden shift on the, the word socialist and a sudden shift on the feeling about like, well, is what we have actually the best thing that we have? So a lot of people joined the DSA. Um, at that time, again, remember, 100, 200 uh, of people, they're like, okay, how do we organize? Like, suddenly we just have, like, this list of names that is our members. Like, how do we, like, we, we can email them, we can call these members, like, but how do, how do we become an actual organization that does things? Um, well, how do we, first I already listed the first technology, obviously email. Um, email was a, is a huge part. And email, when we, when we are thinking about email and we're thinking about these different groups that are working on different things, um, of people need email lists, and what do we use but Google Groups. In fact, all of the technical infrastructure in the very beginning was uh, Google Groups, Google Drives, Google Spreadsheets, and of course, Facebook uh, for events and Twitter. And we haven't been able to move away completely from, from these uh, resources. Um, we're pretty um, married to them in some sense because we want to use the thing that has the lowest barrier to entry for our members who are many of them not technical and many of them don't use computers very often. Um, 
and, inf and everyone has an email, almost everyone has a Gmail account, and so it's very like, everything is connected to their existing computer workflow. Um, ah, so anyway, so Google Groups, Facebook for events, of course, Facebook is essentially like this public posting board, and in this way our, our events are public because we're a public organization. Um, and, uh, but as we've grown over the last two and a half years, we've had like the more of the opportunity when we have a, a problem that can be solved using technology to introspect and choose what technology we're using. And what's really nice about the result of that is that often we use, we choose free software for the freedom. Um, so it's nice that although, you know, well, I'll, I'll, I'll guess I'll explain step by step. Um, one software that's not free software that I have to mention that we also use is Slack. So Slack is the next, one of the next softwares that we adopted um, because a lot of people do like to be chatty online and on their phones and a, a lot of people are getting used to Slack pretty quickly. I wish that, uh, you know, we were all using IRC, but um, <laughs> maybe we can talk about that later. But, or, or that IRC had a friendlier user interface so that we could be using that from the get-go, but instead we're using a proprietary solution and company. Um, but also around the same time that we started the Slack, we started a wiki because we wanted to be able to own our own documentation. We didn't want it to be married to uh, a Google account. Um, we wanted to see kind of uh, the, this like organization of information that comes naturally out of wikis rather than the Google Doc kind of nightmare of uh, permissions and who owns what. Um, and that has turned out to be pretty useful. We have, uh, well, we have 200 users uh, on the wiki, which is a lot less than 1,700, but matches more closely the number of super core active organizers within the organization. And it's used as a place to record things like how-to documents and like the structure of the organization and, and informal policies or, or like decisions that have been made along the run. We have, so that's been a, a, a really good um, win, I think, from early on. Uh, we also have a WordPress, of course. This actually started a WordPress website. Um, and the WordPress website imports all of the Facebook events so that people don't have to go to Facebook to look at the events, um, which is nice. Um, and then the next software pro problem that we had was that we wanted to have a online place for voting and discussion because uh, all of the voting and the discussion that happened for the first year happened in the general meetings that happen once per month that of course not everyone could make, especially not all 1,700 members, but usually only about 100 people can make the general meetings. So we didn't want just 100 people to be weighing in on the decisions of the chapter. So um, we are looking into online Voting opportunities, we actually first tried to use Lumio, and I'm really sad. We tried very hard to use Lumio, actually. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't for a few problems, which perhaps we can discuss later. But mostly, it was their rank choice. Voting um, was not well implemented. <laughs> and uh, so now we, we use a proprietary solution for voting um, called OpaVote for, for now. Um, we might try to look into um, something else or using uh, Lumio in the future. And for an online discussion board, we're using Discourse um, before these votes. We, all these things we host our, ourselves on various hosting sites and maintain. Uh, and then the, the last problem that kind of we're currently ongoing, the ongoing solution for is uh, we're spinning up a CIVI CRM instance to do member management. Right now, member management is in a Google Sheet, all 1,600 members. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, anyway, it's a bit of a mess. Um, we tried using Action Network, which is a proprietary solution, but it let us down in a lot of ways. So, so VCRM is where we're at. Free software. free software, yeah. So the free software that we use is WordPress, Wiki, Discourse, and CiviCRM. Um, thank you for uh, listening. I hope that was entertaining. Oh, you have your mic. Yeah, two mics. Um, okay, hi everyone. So um, I wrote up a little thing to say. Um, so I'm a PhD student at MIT Seasdale, and I'm more on the research side. So thinking about how to actually uh, improve our systems for online discourse in terms of the, their design or their functionality. Um, so primarily I've been focusing on thinking about how to redesign our discussion tools, things like our email systems, our chat systems, our forums, uh, and primarily focusing on 
how to give both individuals and communities more power uh, to, to do things like um, the things that they want to do and, the, and to customize the things they want to do on their discussion platforms. Um, so this has taken me in a couple different directions. Um, so first, I, I've done a number of studies to kind of under, try to understand the problems that communities um, such as the DSA face with online discussion and collaboration. Uh, mostly through um, conducting interviews, large-scale surveys, um, large-scale data analysis. So some groups that I've studied include um, some large mailing list communities, such as uh, the MIT CSAIL uh, mailing list, um, one of the W3C working groups. Um, I've done some research in the Wikipedia's community for um, online deliberation, uh, as well as uh, like citizen democracy platforms like Decide Madrid, um, and I've also um, conducted a long study with people who face harassment online. Um, and learned a lot of really interesting, really interesting things, a lot of really interesting problems that these communities face. Um, and these things I've learned, I've also, I've been trying to feed those into new tools that um, I prototype and build and release. Um, so, so really quickly, um, one of the things that I learned was a lot of the work being done today in these communities to do things like understand or summarize or curate or take notes from a discussion, um, basically extracting knowledge or action from discussions, is really often usually left to like one person or a few people. It's kind of not really a, di a distributed task. Um, and those people are tend to be pretty overloaded. Uh, or on the, on the other hand, no one does it at all, which is a separate problem. Um, uh, particularly for, for newcomers to the community in that case. Um, so I've, I've seen this crop up in a whole bunch of different communities, um, like folks who are closing RFCs on Wikipedia. This, this is like a really small community that, uh, of people who are doing that, um, who are pretty overloaded. Scribing and note-taking in meetings, always difficult for the scribe then to, to participate. Um, people who try to curate or clean up the discussion boards, it usually only falls to a, a small number of people. Um, and partly the reason why is because we found that people, uh, when we talk to them about participating in this kind of activity, is that they feel really nervous about doing it. Um, even folks who are longtime members of the community will say something like, oh, I'm not an expert, or like, oh, I feel weird, like, taking on this kind of role. Um, and understandably, it can be kind of a, a big undertaking sometimes. Um, but, but actually, I think that the, the act of understanding, summarizing, curating is, is actually something that everyone can benefit from in a community. Um, and you know, if we could break down that work so that it's not something that's super daunting, it's like not this huge task, um, maybe more people could participate more easily. Um, so, so one of the things I've been working on is building new tools for collaborative summarization, collaborative note-taking that's more integrated into forums and chat systems so you can do this while you're conversing. Um, and, and also building the tools so that they're really deeply linked, so that for someone who's looking to get involved in a community or, getting, or get caught up in a community, they can go look at that and then read the discussions that are behind it. Uh, and then one other thing I wanted to mention was that um, another thing we learned was that people have a lot of different ways that they would like to customize um, the way that they conduct and receive discussion. Uh, but, but a lot of the systems that we use today um, have really kind of rudimentary personal filtering or targeting um, or moderation capabilities. Uh, so one example, a great example, is mailing lists, actually. You know, everybody uses mailing lists, but there, there are not many features on mailing lists for doing this sort of thing. So uh, one of the things I've been working on is, is trying to add some of these features back into mailing lists, things like being able to follow specific topics or people or block or mute specific things. Um, one, for instance, one thing I've found from talking to people in mailing list communities is that sometimes people can be really hesitant about posting to a mailing list because you're worried about spamming other people. Uh, and for that reason, they tend to self-censor. Um, but maybe people would be more willing to participate if they had a way to you know, tell the system, like make their message spread more slowly or target their message to certain subgroups and that sort of thing. Um, so that's something I'm building into a new mailing list system. Uh, and then on the other side, the receiving side of the equation, um, I've been speaking to some folks who um, deal with online harassment, like I mentioned. So folks who are getting kind of mobbed with a lot of hateful messages. Um, and there I've been working on 
a tool to help people recruit friends that, to help them actually moderate their inbox for them. Um, and just more generally, I think this idea of more decentralized moderation tools um, could be really helpful for thinking about content moderation that's like not in a top-down kind of uh, mechanism. So another space I've been thinking about that is this question of uh, online misinformation. Um, yeah, um, that's all I'll say. Uh, if you're interested in trying out my tools, checking out the code, or reading some of the papers I've written in this research space, they're all on my website. Yep. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so my name's, well, I've already been introduced with my name. But uh, um, so the, some of the stuff I've worked on over the years is uh, I originally got into developing uh, de you know, decentralized social network things as in terms of building the application. The problem was with Media Goblin, we had you know, multiple Media Goblin sites and they couldn't actually talk to each other. It turns out things people really want out of social networks is to be able to speak to each other. So if you have a decentralized social network, people can't speak to each other. You know, and this is interesting with you know, self-hosting services. I think this comes up a lot. You have multiple self-hosted services and people can't actually communicate across those self-hosted services. So that's why I got involved in the W3C's uh, standardization of ActivityPub, uh, which is a federated social network standard to have these different sites talk to each other. But that's not what I'm, uh, um, but, you know, and that's been fairly successful, you know, Mastodon and uh, Pleroma and a bunch of other projects picked that up. Um, what I'm working on today is something called Sprightly, which is kind of trying to take some of those ideas and kind of bring them to the next level. You know, how do we protect against servers going down and then all of their content going with it. You can't talk to each other e anymore. You know, how do you do all these type of things? You know, and it might be fun if we do things as a distributed social game too. You know, stuff like that. So, um, uh, but, but, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on saying more stuff until, uh, I, I guess, as a, maybe, we're, I, are we, um, well, I mean, I, I actually think I wanna um, maybe jump in a little bit more reactively for the rest of my stuff, because I wanted to, um, jump to a point that, you, that was specifically raised about about the Slack thing and the IRC thing, um, which was because uh, that's really interesting to me. You know, as somebody who's trying to work on distributed network things, it really saddens me that we had this this you know this protocol called IRC, and the free software community um, figured out how to get our communities to be able to talk to each other and collaborate and all this stuff, and but it was like only us, right? Like talking to each other. And then like, like, and now like the whole rest of the world is like, wow, we can do distributed collaboration. We've got this thing, it looks, and I'm like, that thing looks exactly like IRC, right? Like, but like, it feels like in some ways like that's a, like, may, is that a failure on our parts? Like, what do you think? Like as somebody who is, I know you use IRC a lot, you know, like, and it's connected to that, like what, what do you think is the source of that? Like what, how could that affect, you know, your organization? Like as, where, what, what leads to that? I, I, I'm just really interested in a follow up on that, that statement you made. Okay, cool. Well, um, that's such a, I feel like this is a, such a huge question and it, I'm, I'm wondering where to even, uh, what part of it to talk about. But of course, we, we all know, and I, I feel like this is a topic that gets discussed every Libra Planet again and again, which is the user interface part of free software projects, um, not always being user-friendly to non-technical people. Um, and uh, I uh, just, yeah, I don't, I don't know where to begin, <laughs> to, e to, to begin. But, but one, one thing that is that um, most people who are not free, s or like not, not engineers or, or nerds really want to use what's right in front of them and are, I think, just mostly influenced by fads in what decision, like what technology they get to use. Um, and uh, and Slack is really like spiffy and has emojis and um, all, all this stuff that I think makes it like fun to use in the same way that people are already using Facebook and WhatsApp and other applications like that. Um, so IRC doesn't have those bells and whistles. I think maybe before people got really used to having those bells and whistles, it might have been a little bit more easy to imagine convincing social movements to use something like IRC. But of course, we would also need really great user-friendly um, clients for them. And um, we've never had that. We've never, I mean, I, I think there maybe are some like clients for IRC on phones, but um, I've never used one. And are there? I don't know. <laughs> but there are IRC yeah, yeah. clients for phones. <laughs> and of course, then your server, your organization would have to 
host an IRC server. Or, right? or, or and, use and a channel on an IRC server. Right, yeah, and like if Slack just provides that for you, you know, right. then. Right, but it's frustrating because IRC does provide that for you in a way, You, if you could make a channel on an IRC ch server, right? Right, if you choose somebody else's. IRC if you some, choose someone else's, which is what people are doing with Slack. They're choosing someone else's servers to uh, like host their organization's data, right? So. Um, there's so many parallels. It's it's so frustrating, but it really all comes down to the usability and the and the and the popularity of software in this fad like way. I think. Uh. Just want to jump in with uh, additional thought on that. So, in addition to the kind of shiny appeal of things like Slack, uh, I wonder how much of it comes from uh, being backed by venture capital and venture capital firms that are saying, hey, our other company is using this thing. You should use this thing. Let's spend some money on marketing. Uh, and I wonder how f uh, free and open software uh, projects could uh, respond to that or uh, reach that number of people without that type of approach. Uh, and I think there are some examples um, you know, uh, Mastodon is one to come to mi uh, that comes to mind that have really reached a lot of people without any kind of, you know, major financial backing. Uh, and I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts on how to do that. Um, I think, I think, so, so some of the messaging that seems to, um, and I want to hear what the, I want to return to your continuation uh, in a moment. Uh, the the I think that so some of the, the it sounds like a common thread that we've got here is that shiny and fun is really key, right? Like that, like in like we might have all the right ideas, and in fact, I think a lot of the free because free software very early on was in the early frontier of figuring out how to do things like how to collaborate on the internet. You know, we figured out a lot of stuff, and yet we haven't somehow ported that to a lot of different communities. You know, and like. And like, you know, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to throw on my spouse here, but my spouse, you know, is trying to, uh, Morgan Lemmer Weber here is trying to work on, um, you know, uh, digital humanities project and, you know, has recently started picking up doing things, you know, using plain text formats in Git. And how hard is it to get other people to, you know, pick up those kinds of things, right? And yes, I mean, but there is a large venture capitalist organization back in Git, right? And of course, people are using that as their general place where they host things, but there's still a deep amount of terror of using something like that. And it might also be that our, our tooling has largely been built because as programmers, conveniently, um, for historical reasons, most of our programming languages are not visual but are text-based, right? So we just built all these tools that were really nice for text-based people, like, and things like future revisions and stuff like that work with that kind of thing in mind. What happens if you're not you know, starting out with that kind of text-based thing, but we might not have built our tools with those kinds of users in mind. So I think it may, can also be, and I'm, ex you know, as the like, you know, list enthusiast of the room, you know, I'm extremely the, the type of person who can be very, like, you know, like Lisp and Emacs, yeah, this is really cool, who like, can be like very insular of like, you know, like these are the kind of tools that are fun for me. I think if we aren't careful about figuring out, wait, 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 how do we get this out of our group? We might have the best ideas, but then a venture capitalist organization might just swoop in and then take all of the nice, like, structural ideas that we have and then strip away all that user freedom stuff. It, it sounds like you're saying software developers need empathy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that, I mean, there's something special about social tools also, which is that you have to consider network effects, right? So the, the only reason why I'm still on Facebook today is because there are a few Facebook groups that they have their conversations on Facebook and I really need to be a part of that conversation and those aren't happening elsewhere. And because then uh, that means I'm going to Facebook, that means that other things can also reach me on Facebook. And that's true for a lot of the social tools that I'm on. It's like there are a few people or a few groups that I need to connect with, connect with and therefore I'm on those things. Um, so I think one thing to consider is first, like, are there ways that we can open up that walled garden so that you can be like in two places at the same time? Um, so one example I think I talked to you about a little bit before was like this idea of like being able to post like on Facebook and concurrently post on like a mailing list and having 
those things you know, hit the other thing at, at the same time, right? Uh, and so then you don't really feel like I have to be on Facebook to have this conversation. It can, it can be mirrored on a mailing list. Same thing for Slack and IRC, for instance. Like, can you just have conversations that happen on Slack also happen on IRC and vice versa? And you can use the platform that you want to use. To um, bring that point back to the DSA, I think there's only one example where we do something like this, and it's the importing events from Facebook into our WordPress website um, to try to, again, I, I think we all lament the fact that, that Facebook is all the only option we have, even though that most of the people in the Boston DSA are young millennials who use Facebook like uh, more than any of them would ever like to admit. but. Um, they, they also feel this like feeling like this is a source of, like this is a bad part of our life, the fact that like um, one company owns all of our data. Like people are aware of this even though they aren't, don't have a background of user freedom or thinking about it from like the free software perspective. They still feel this like looming like, oh, it sucks that we're married to this platform for the network effect. And like it's very easy to make the argument um, like what you said, which is how can we make sure that no one is required to use Facebook. Um, Slack is, I, I, I'm trying every day to battle the battle of like, I don't want to require people to use Slack, but it's getting more and more difficult because it's such a, like IRC, such a wonderful place to informally ask questions and get connected to people that you aren't otherwise connected to. Um, a lot of that ha connection happens in in-person meetings, but not if you go to only one working group and what you want is like a designer and um, you can post on Slack and someone who participates in a completely different part of the organization can suddenly like help you out with that one project. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful tool, but frustrating that it's such a walled garden. So something that's another interesting thread that seems to be coming out of this to me is about um, identity as in terms of, you know, our, our identities online and how, um, you know, uh, uh, I hate to, uh, um, you, uh, you, you said something interesting to me, which was, I think that it was that, that the uh, Democratic uh, Socialist uh, group is using uh, email addresses as like the person's primary identity, right? Yeah, and, and I thought that, that was really funny because you know, like, like who, you know, when people describe who they are, um, a lot of our current focus is, you know, and to what you said about, you know, being able to, couldn't you, shouldn't you be able to be on those multiple things? Well, you know, this monk person in me might say, oh, well, that's what federation's for, right? Al although it, we haven't really answered that in our federated social networks either, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, and I'm sure you have also followed many people in the Fediverse where you notice they have like 20 different accounts. And they feel like each one of those accounts is for like a different like kind of like subtopic of themselves, right? And like, why, why do we have this cultural feeling? And is it cultural or is it technical? that we need, that like we don't have, um, I feel like there's two funny things here. One, um, you know, when your identity is kind of like, I know a lot of people who introduce themselves by their Twitter handle, right? Like I'm at whatever, right? And they have no control over their thing, right? You know, or by their domain name. I'm, you know, whatever, you know, I'm dustycloud.org, right? Except, you know, that's also something I'm just leasing from ICANN. Right, you know, I don't own DustyCloud.org. I just lease it. Uh, um, I have a lot more thoughts about why I think our structure of identity is really problematic, the way that we've laid it out, and how maybe we can improve it. Um, but I feel like I would get really rabbit holey about it. So I'm, I'm kind of maybe I should throw it over to the other panelists to hear what you're, like, what do you think about the way that we structure identity and, and we can maybe do better. Uh, I'll just add one thing to that. So the. Uh, the thing that I pick up as interesting there is that identity seems coupled to uh, content. You know, the community that you create content in is also your identity, your Twitter handle and your Twitter feed, your Mastodon username and your Mastodon feed. Um, and in terms of community moderation, uh, one of the great things about federation uh, and in open source software, free free software is that each community can def define its own code of conduct, its own set of standards, um, but you, can, you only have one identity, so it's necessary to be able to participate in multiple communities somehow, and uh, it sounds like you're saying that's lacking 
uh, and might be something that future software could pay attention to. Um, yeah, I also think, so I think there's some funny things about identity where the assumption that, um, A, the assumption that we only have one identity is false, right? Like, um, you know, you may be, um, you may be, you may as a person embody multiple things. You may be this professional persona when you go, you know, like uh, go to work and then you may come home and play a game with your tabletop gaming community a very different persona. You may go online, you may have, you know, your fan fiction account where you're posting under a handle that nobody else knows, right? Something like that. Like, I think it's actually completely legitimate for people to have multiple identities when it's appropriate for them to have multiple identities. But what really worries me is that um, we're moving to a technical structure where people are having to rent their identities from, uh, you know, from basically, you know, basically rent your identity from a corporation. You really don't have control over that. And that, like, kind of scares me. All right. Uh, d do we have uh, more thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to point out, like, there, there's also the other side of that, which is, like, when you can create an unlimited number of identities, how that affects things like online harassment um, and content moderation, I guess, more generally. Um, so I've spoken to many people who, like, maybe even just have one harasser, but that one harasser is able to create many, many different email accounts over and over again so that it's impossible to block that person. In the particular case of the DSA, um, and also I think a lot of activists collaboration in general were really concerned with I identity, um, not from like an individual perspective, but from a trust perspective, right? So um, in the DSA, uh, we really want to know on all of these different tools that we use, uh, we want to know that that person, to, like their identity across all of these platforms. And we also want to know them into meet space, right? We, we trust people online when we know them personally and um, get to collaborate with them personally. Um, and when we know other people that we know in person uh, who know them, um, at least within like the DSA. We're constantly just, you know, trying to create a huge network of, of trust in order, order to do these complicated projects that we're doing um, that are sometimes adversarial to the state or the right, um, the all right. So yeah, they, it, but at, at the same time, we, there's like this concern about protecting people's like rights to privacy. We don't wanna be publishing members' names where they don't wanna be published um, in case they are vulnerable, so. I, I'm only adding more pro lists, like more to the problem of identity, but it, it is interesting, and perhaps I'll just explain, maybe this is interesting for the audience, that, that it's true, what we have is a list of member names and emails, and it's that email that we use to prove who they are before they get access to a new kind of resource. We email them, and we're like, is this this person? And if they email us back, we're like, this email now has an account on this, like, you know, whatever. It is we want, and that's how we track numbers across all of these resources. But it is what it is. It works. It's still renting, I suppose. All right. So we just have a few minutes left. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, any of the panelists have final thoughts to conclude the the state of uh, free software for large scale uh, collaboration. Um. I think that. I'm really interested in talking with people who are really interested in talking about the identity and uh, harassment side of things, uh, actually. And I think uh, um, I think a lot of the work that Amy is doing is really great in that the public um, kind of uh, spaces thing really requires uh, moderation or at least some level of a network of trusted relationships, right? That you have to be able to um, walk somehow. Um, I think that we actually can eliminate private message harassment entirely. Um, I don't think I have enough time to go down that rabbit hole. It involves some things called Zuko's Triangle and pet names and stuff like that. Um, but uh, a hint is that uh, um, you might, there may, there may be no reason why you would, instead of you having one email address, you couldn't have many email addresses. And instead, if we take the approach, uh, if those are completely unintelligible the way that like Tor Onion addresses are like gobbledygook.onion, um, you could have many addresses that people could get to. You, you can hand them out to many people, and uh, um, you could hand out specific things like this thing gets you direct access to me. This thing ends up in my moderation queue. 
this thing, you have to pay me five cents and I might refund it to you, or might not if you're a spammer and you have to pay to spam me, right? Um, it, so the, my point here is that I think we often get caught up in this, duet, this false duality of, um, is it a social tech solution or a technical solution? And I think that's bullshit. Like any, any appropriate solution, both of those things inform each other. So I think we need, we need to have, you know, to go back to empathy, we need to have, you know, the people who are willing to think about very computer science-y approaches, but with a highly empathetic social um, responsibility perspective to actually build the right tools to make people safe. Yeah, just to conclude, I guess um, we'll each say a little thing. Um, I, I think that the communication tools we use today are fundamentally like broken, like both in public, private, like places. Um, you know, people may be using the the Facebooks and whatever a lot more, but um, I think that the models that they are putting forth are you know non democratic. They're they're often very top down moderation structures, um, and you see like a lot of harmful social things happening as a result of that. Um, so I really think that we need to think of new models and I think the best place to do that is in the open and in a community like this one. I, I want to um, say a, a pretty positive note about uh, the free software use by large scale cooperative projects. And, and uh, like again, also how excited I am about the work that both of you do for um, from the perspective of as an activist because uh, the, the story that I told at the beginning was a story of like a whole organization choosing free software uh, solutions um, again and again because um, again we have the freedom we get to control it and also because th as uh, these software technologies like become more part of the mainstream there are just more and more people that are familiar with using them and I think maybe there's this thought that a lot of free software projects are like you know, only usable by free software people. And I think that's that the DSA is proving that to simply not be the case. Like there's just more and more people who are programmers and tech savvy and like if there's a free software solution, we will prefer it because it is like more free. We have more control. We have the feeling that we might be able to contribute and that the community will support it and that we aren't reliant on a, a company that we can't trust. And um, and we are already making the, the ones that exist work as best we can for our situation, and they're aiding us, even though they're shitty. They're still helping us out, and and I can see lots of room for improvement. And the community has already m improved a lot of the, the the things that we use. I think a lot of developers of free software actually do have a lot of empathy, and um, and it seems like there's only more to come. So I'm really excited about the tools that are being made, and I'm just telling you, keep making tools for um, social community or for communities or to aid like the the world that we live in and the collaboration um, that we aim to achieve. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, and I think that's a great note to end on. So thank you all for coming, and thank you, panelists. <laughs>